Most people listen to podcasts to learn something, to be entertained and to walk away feeling inspired, perhaps even educated a bit. Hello, I'm Devo and I'm one of the two hosts of our show, The Little Impolite Podcast. Welcome and thanks for listening. This show is for the expansive, open-minded creative whose persistent curiosity towards integrating new information in their lives never stops. Think of it as the free thinkers toolkit for anyone that refuses to enroll in the conformity of all of those around them, instead forging their own paths with fortitude and love. It's that slightly unapologetic conversation with that new friend you just met that sort of wistfully and effortlessly pushes the conversation into spaces that you never expected. It's the deep-hearted conversations with purposeful and thoughtful individuals that have finally figured out their superpowers and are now pouring into it with gusto and love. We're delighted to host these conversations with you that lead us down the conversation well. But watch your step, because most of our guests, and of course, Lisa and I, are a little impolite. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Devo, and next to me is Lisa my Staff. fantastic counterpart, Lisa Staff. And welcome to the Little Impolite Podcast. Today we have a really interesting guest. She's been on Dr. Oz. She's a two-time TEDx speaker. She's a two-time author. She's an international best-selling author twice. And this is Dr. Debbie Silber, and she's the founder of the Post Betrayal Transformation Institute. I have to look at my notes because that's a mouthful. And she is going to come on here and talk to us a little bit about psychology and health mindset and personal development on betrayal. And we and both have okay. some betrayal in our who has, <laughs> Honestly, who has not been betrayed? Whether it's like on the playground when you were five years old and you're ca- carrying that with you still. Wait, wait, I know a, this story. What happened in a, No. <laughs> Jeff McIntyre, if you're out there, I didn't appreciate being chased around and snowballs thrown in my face <laughs> when you said you were my friend. No one likes having their face washed out with snow. I know. That's Especially Maybe that's Canada. just in Canada. <laughs> no, it's anywhere. I didn't grow up with snow, but no one likes snow. Honestly, right? No balls in the face. Right. And that's why I said no to you, Jeff, when you asked me out in the 12th grade. Wait, but didn't you run into Jeff years later? Or was that a different story? That was a different story. What? Someone that I went out with and then I ran into my Ikea. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different okay, person? Yeah, that was Bill. Oh, and when okay. I ran into him, I had, white I, had, <laughs> I had two kids with me and was nursing and was not looking very good. And he was with a tall, gorgeous blonde you know that moment when you want to show up for that ex-boyfriend and look really good? Why would you want to show up for an ex-boyfriend and look good? I'm just good? joking. What the <laughs> do I, just are joking. we going to have Dr. Just, Debbie no, do some okay, betrayal like, on us listen, right now? Listen, women at any point when they're seeing an ex, just like if you were seeing an ex, you kind of want to show up and look good. You don't want to have baby goober all over you, but that's fine. He felt good about it because he looked at me and he was like, thank God we didn't go any further. <laughs> You made the right choice. You made the right choice, Bill. <laughs> well, while Lisa figures out how she can peacock a little bit more and the next no. time she encounters a boyfriend, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Debbie and we are going to have some serious chats about betrayal because it is a real thing. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize there was an actual syndrome around it, but apparently we hold on to trauma. We know that. Um, but trauma around betrayal sort of becomes like this haunting ghost over time and it affects yeah. our future relationships. It affects our personal narrative of who, who we are and how we view ourselves. So she's going to sort of break it down and yeah. help us understand it in lay people terms. It was really interesting because the whole program that she has, she has different stages that you go through. So she goes into depth with those stages, mm-hmm. but it's interesting to me that she can help you. A lot of people she'll, she'll give the symptoms or what they're experiencing and that they think they're fine. And she's like, no, you've been in that stage for 20 years and getting through that stage and to the next and to the final stage is really the only way that you're able to slough that off and have actual real joy Absolutely. in your, in your life, in relationships and, and, and ultimately happiness. Speaking of joy and healthy relationships, we have a download at the end of this uh, show. You like that, that segue? Was smooth. We have a download at the end of the show that we would love for you to check out. It's free. It's not going to cost you anything, but your email address, wink, wink. And it's going to, It's sort of our take on how we manage our social media. We run a bunch of different businesses, but how we have a healthy relationship with social media and still not get caught up as just like being obsessed with it and addicted to it and in your phone 24-7. Okay. So if you're new to the podcast, you probably don't realize that we're 
we've both started out as photographers. We still create lots of content, but a lot of that is directed towards um, our business, Sprout Connectors, where we deal with branding, marketing, content creation, social media for small businesses. And the thing that we run into all the time, and the reason why we get business is because people are overwhelmed with social media, but not everyone can afford to hire uh, a team to do that. And we've found that a lot of these people are frustrated, overwhelmed. They're spending way too much time. So we developed this, Devo um, spearheaded this on on how to create that healthy relationship, how to know when enough is enough, how to streamline everything and still show up the way that you need to show up and get the results that you need. So mm-hmm. that's free. So join us. If you like the show, leave us a comment, drop us some notes, leave us a review because your kind words help us grow the show and bring on more amazing guests that can help us live healthy lives like Dr. Debbie is about to show us how to do. And we realize that you have a lot of different things that you can do with your time. So thank you for sharing some time with us. If you find that this healing some trauma in your life from betrayal or anything like this, there's a lot of other applications from this. Share it with a friend that could maybe use it. Mm -hmm. Are you launching a new business that I'm not aware of over here? No, I'm not. I'm getting a new kitchen implemented and I won't be putting their branding on it because they're not paying me. This would be <laughs> on your kitchen counters? Yeah. That's, that's not odd. going on. That's if not you want <laughs> if you want to talk to us a little bit more, if you have something that you would like to comment on or uh, for us to even follow up on with another podcast and conversation, you can reach Devo at Fusion Photog. Mm-hmm. And you can reach myself at Lisa Staff Photo. On Instagram. On Instagram. All right. Enjoy the show. See you on the other side. Hello, Lisa. Good to see you. I'm sorry we're four hours apart. We have been on the road for the last basically two weeks. You went yeah. one way, I went the other. Thank you for joining us today, wherever you are. We know that you have a lot of choices when it comes to finding interesting podcasts. Two million, to be precise. Did you know there's two million podcasts going on right now across the globe? That's a lot of competition. Holy shit, that's a lot of people. I wonder how many of those are consecutive I should do some research on that. We need doctor, our yeah. guest doctor to do some research on that. Yeah. Let us know Return and report. Wherever you are, we appreciate that you found us and we invite you to join us each week. We bring on some really cool guests that talk about some really cool shit that are doing really cool things on the planet to make people a little bit better. These are expansive, open-minded, critical, and creative thinkers. And we celebrate their expansive curiosity and their spirit and everything they bring to the table. And we are not afraid to ask questions. We just love to learn and we hope that you enjoy our candid conversations. So our guest today is, she's a doctor. She's got some fame. If you look at her website, she's got some serious credentials and she's done a lot of shows. So hopefully she can help us ride on her coattails to more fame and success. We're gonna ask her how to do that. Um, but before we do that, I want to tell a little bit of a story. So the podcast today is going to center around shame and betrayal and sort of the baggage that we carry with that. So I have this friend when I was in high school, this is an old story, but I have this friend, his name was Dominic, and he was like my homie, and we used to get in a lot of trouble. He and I were everywhere together. Um, it got kicked out of class together, did all sorts of things on a regular basis. Simultaneous to that, I met this girl. Her name is Christine. You've heard me talk about Christine before. Oh, and yeah. Christine and I, yeah. yeah, Christine and I dated for two years. So freshman and sophomore year, I dated Christine. In the end of my sophomore year, my dad decided to send me off to, you'll appreciate this. My dad basically sent me off to a Christian academy for the summer to teach me how to be a better human. Apparently Christians can do that better than anyone else, I guess. Or at least that's the word on the street. So I went to this YMCA camp in the mountains and where I got into all sorts of trouble, of course. Um, let me remind me to tell you about the story with the pastor's daughter in an ice skating rink one day. I, I don't want yeah. to. <laughs> I'm just joking. Anyway, so I went to this camp, and, and while I was there, I was there for three months, roughly, becoming a purified Christian. And I, at the, upon return, I discovered that my friend Dominic, my best homie, and my main girl, Christine, had been having fun all summer long in my absence. So I was betrayed. And I've carried that story with me to this day. I'm seeking revenge now that I'm big and famous. No, I'm joking. And so I thought when I first came across Dr. Um, Silver, I was reading a lot of her posts and I saw, I listened to a bunch of her podcasts. And then we had a candid conversation in the, the onboarding. And I was like, with your history and your background, which you're going to tell me about in a second, because I want to share you, share a little bit of, you know, if anybody's been betrayed, it's you, right? So I was hoping we could have. That's not something that I really want to win a contest in. <laughs> 
<laughs> I do have a participant ribbon, but I don't want to be like number one standing on the Olympics podium as like the gold medalist. So I want you to tell you a little bit of a story. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about before she comes on because I love your story. I think it's fascinating. I think you should be writing a book, to be honest with you. But our de- our guest today is Dr. Debbie Silver. Um, she's the founder of the Post Betrayal Transformation Institute. Say that four times very quickly. She is a holistic psychologist. I love that word holistic. I want to find out what that means. She's a health mindset and personal development expert. She has, I believe, I think I saw she has two number one uh, books that have made the, uh, whatever the lists are out there that makes you number one or number two. Um, one of them is The Unshakable Woman. And I think the other one was something to do with uh, the effortless path to release resistance and get unstuck, which is sort of the centerpiece of our conversation today. She's been on CBS and on Fox. She was even on uh, the Dr. Oz show. She's done a couple of TEDx's, which I'm excited to talk about because I'm working on that now. And she's going to come talk to us about getting unstuck and dealing with our past trauma of betrayal and all those sorts of things and just kind of go down the rabbit hole. So thoughts on that? I love this. Um, one thought that's really random. You've got Michael Jackson thriller hands going on and you keep banging on your desk. <laughs> I don't know if you're bringing back that eighties vibe <laughs> with the thriller, but <laughs> you've got my eighties jet chat jacket on today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and you'll be having um, another one getting my zipper fixed today on my other track jacket. Excellent. Now I'm really excited about this because I think this is something that we can all relate to, not your jacket, but all feeling that there's a story that we can tell that we feel like we've been betrayed, whether it's friends, family, um, intimate partners, and there's something in it for all of us, right? Yeah, so you know a little bit about that, and and I'm going to keep putting you on the hot seat on this because I think it's a story that deserves to be told, just sort of high level. Are these these lights getting extra hot? (laughs) Is it getting hot in here? So no, but for real, be candid with me for a minute because we've never really openly talked about this. And I, and I hope the doctor kind of supports me on this, is sort of having this conversation around it. You you were in 30 years involved in a relationship. Can I go in this direction? Am I cool with this? Yeah. yeah. You know what? I, th- I think there's, you know, we, we hold it really close to our, our chest for a long time because there's a lot of shame around it. Mm-hmm. And we internalize a lot of it as to what did I do wrong? Am I not enough? Am I, you know, what mistakes did I make? So, and, and, you know, I don't want to come across as being bitter either. So there's that whole, you know, that's still the father of my children, all of that. But I think, I think we're always on a struggle bus with it too, and how comfortable we are with sharing what the actual facts are and how much we candy coat it and how it reflects on us. But yeah, I'm I'm diving in. I'm 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 diving in. Ask me, ask me all the questions. All right, so for 30 years, you were involved in a relationship. I'm going to bring Doc in right now because I really want to get her on here. Um, but I want to talk about sort of high level in those 30 years, what you were subject to and go into sort of a little bit around that, okay? Sure. So go. We're on the hot seat. Hot seat. Um, and, and you know what? This isn't going to be anything different than what she's heard a million times already, right? I'm sure. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's my story, but it, it could be a series of everybody's stories. So I was married relatively young, and um, I was um, 19, married in, and um, converted to being a Mormon and thought that, you know, I'm, I'm trying really hard, I'm doing all the right things, you know, I'm, I'm basically promised a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and I'm going to do all these things. So I had a 30-year marriage, which I thought was monogamous, but apparently it was open. <laughs> And I found out within the first year that um, relationships were going on behind my back, always with somebody that I knew, a friend, colleague, whatever, was told um, through um, church leaders that, you know what, if you don't forgive him, you're as much to blame, this is a man, you should, you know, a lot of the patriarchy, all of that, Um, you know, your mother, you know, all, all of these things. So I, I think throughout that, always being um, disappointed, promised things, thinking, what am I doing wrong? Am I enough? Uh, you know, I'll try again, all of these things, um, constantly having that happen. So, of course, trust issues, but, you know, he's a man, so that's supposed to be expected. Well, not really. <laughs> um, 
So I think the last time it happened, it was a, like a universal sign. Honestly, there's a lot of signs that a lot of red flags that go up throughout our lives and we choose to ignore them. Um, and we have a million and one excuses as to why we're ignoring them. For me, it was, you know, I have four kids. I just had a, ba a baby or I'm pregnant or um, we've just moved to the United States. And, you know, like, where do I go if I move out? I, because I've been mothering, I don't have the income to support. Like, there's, there's a million and one excuses. As well as the fact that people thought we were the perfect couple. So so much shame around that, so much shame even telling my closest friends what my life really was like. And then that moment coming where there was the last big reveal where it was like, how many times do I need to be hit on the head? This is, this is the opportunity that I need to take because it's not changing. And then I had things fall into place that made it possible. A lot of fabulous women that stepped up and without knowing gave me the opportunity to make that step and know that you know what? I was enough all this time. So that's it kind of encapsulated. There's so many more juicy parts. Oh, Doctor, thank yeah. you for joining us. Really appreciate <laughs> you taking the time out of your busy day. I know you've got a lot of things going on in your world. So thanks for being on our show today. No, oh, looking forward to our conversation. And you know what you're saying is so unfortunately so common. And, you know, betrayal is one of those things. You know, think about it. When the person we trust the most proves untrustworthy, who do we trust? When the ones we run to when other people are causing the harm are the ones causing the harm, where do we go? So it's it's such a weird trauma because it's uh, it completely shatters the self. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're talking about uh, partners who cheated on us, but betrayal comes in many forms. It's not just mm -hmm. with our partners. You know, I, I arguably a very untrusting person, Alisa has had to deal with some of that over the, over the last few years since I've known her. And it's been sort of a cornerstone of most of my life, which is why I'm so intrigued to have a conversation with you because um, I never realized it was something that affected me or my behaviors. But after sort of kind of getting divorced and then starting to do some introspective analysis of myself, I realized that I have a lot of unturned stones that, that are growing some moss, if you will. So. Um, it, it comes in the form of your parents and come in the form of your relationships, your career, all sorts of different things. And one of the things that <clears throat> I loved about some of your work is that if you can learn to heal from these betrayals, it sort of leads to a different type of transformation that, you know, other types of therapies could do. Could you talk a little bit about that and expound on that a bit? Yeah. And, and you know, it's one of those, you're right. It's, it's not just partner. I mean, this is a family member, a friend, a coworker, self, someone in a position of authority. And really the way it works is the more we trust and depend on the person, the deeper the betrayal. So for example, a child who's completely dependent on their parent, and then the parent does something awful, that's going to have a different impact than let's say your best friend sharing your secret, right? Still a betrayal, different level of cleanup left in the wake. But it's one of those things that if, you know, we count on time to heal it, time, you know, we've all heard time heals all wounds. When it comes to betrayal, I have the proof. That's not true. That's not true. And there are classic ways we know that shattered trust and a betrayal hasn't healed. For example, we'll see it in health, in business, in relationships. Like in relationships, I'll see it in one of two ways. The first way is in a repeat betrayal. The faces change, but it's the same thing. People say, what the heck? I keep going from partner to partner to partner, friend to friend to friend, boss to boss to boss. It's the same thing. Is it me? Yes, it is. Not in that it's your fault, in that it's your opportunity. There is a profound lesson needing to be learned. Maybe you are lovable, worthy, and deserving. You need better boundaries in place, whatever it is. Until and unless you get that, you will keep getting opportunities in the form of people to teach you. The other way we see it in relationships is the big wall goes up. We're like, nope, been there, done that. No one's getting near me again. We think that's coming from a place of strength. It's not. It's coming from fear. Health, we see it all the time, where someone goes to the most well-meaning doctors, coaches, healers, therapists to manage a stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. At the root of it is an unhealed betrayal, shattered trust. Work, we see it all the time at work, where people go, they want to ask for that raise or promotion. They deserve it, but their confidence was shattered, so they don't have the confidence to ask. Or they want to be a team player, collaborative partner, but the person they trusted the most proved untrustworthy. How do they trust that boss, that coworker, that collaborative partner? So it shows up everywhere. 
So your work that you've done, I was reading on your bio and on your website, you had some betrayal of your own, which sort of was the catalyst to take you down this space. You went back to school, got your PhD in this sort of modality of, of therapy. Mm-hmm. Your work at the core of what it is, it's not necessarily addressing the betrayal itself, right? Or we, at least the way I understand it, you're sort of getting to the root of the problem intrinsically with the individual and how they suffered from it and then how the the self-image they took on about themselves around that is that a good way to say that it's really cleaning it up once and for all so we you know we need to know where someone's starting so we know how to move them through it one you know that the you you referenced the phd I went back for and i did a study on betrayal what holds us back what helps us heal and what happens to us physically mentally and emotionally when the people closest to us lie cheat and deceive that study made three groundbreaking discoveries. But with that, one of the discoveries is while we can stay stuck for years, decades, a lifetime, and so many of us do, if we're going to fully, fully heal, we're going to move through five proven predictable stages. And we even know what happens physically, mentally, emotionally at every one of those stages. And we know what it takes to move from one stage to the next. So our work is really finding out what stage someone is in so we can just predictably move them through it. Can you talk a little bit about those stages? Oh, sure. So that we can recognize them. Yeah. And for me, you know, out of the three discoveries, this was the most exciting because now there's a roadmap instead of like hoping we heal or winging it or just trying a few different things. Now it was like, okay, you mean to say if I just do this, I'll get to the next stage and this I'll get to the next stage. Yes, that's the case. So it's what our certified coaches are all trained in is certified in. It's what I share and trust again. I'm going to share it with you now. So The first stage is like a setup stage. And if you can imagine four legs of a table, the four legs being physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. What I saw with everybody was this, me too, was this real heavy lean on the physical and the mental thinking and doing, and not really prioritizing the emotional and the spiritual feeling and being, right? So if you can imagine a table with only two legs, easy for that table to topple over, that's us. Now that's not to say if you're busy thinking and doing, which is how most of us walk around during the day, you'll be betrayed. It was just a typical profile I saw. Stage two, shock, you're blindsided. D-Day, Discovery Day. And here's the breakdown of the body, mind, and the worldview. This is the scariest of all of the stages. And what happens right here is you've ignited the stress response. You're now headed for every single stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. And, and you probably remember the moment you know your betrayal happened, where you were, what was going on, that feeling, that's what's going on right now. Your mind is in a complete and total state of chaos and overwhelm. You can't wrap your mind around what you just learned. This makes no sense. Hard to believe. And your worldview has just been shattered. Your worldview is your mental model. It's the rules that prevent chaos that govern you. Trust this person. Don't go there. This is how life works. And in a moment, everything you've known to be real and true is no longer. The bottom is bottomed out and a new bottom hasn't been formed yet, right? Like it's when you found out about your friend and your girlfriend. It's like when you found out about your husband, right? Same right here. And it's terrifying. But think about it. If the bottom were to bottom out on you, what would you do? You'd grab hold of anything and everything you could to stay safe and stay alive. And that's stage three. Survival instincts emerge. It's the most practical out of all of the stages. If you can't help me, get out of my way. How do I survive this experience? Where do I go? Who can I trust? How do I feed my kids? Right? By far, stage three is the most common place to get stuck. And most people stay there. And here's why. Once you've figured out how to survive your experience, because it feels so much better than the shock and trauma of where you just came from, we think it's good. And because we don't know there's anywhere else to go, we don't know there's a stage four or stage five. Transformation doesn't even begin until stage four. But because we don't know there's anywhere else to go, we start planting roots here. We're not supposed to, but we don't know that. And four things happen. The first thing is, and remember back when you were in this stage, the first thing is we start getting these small self benefits from being here. We get to be right. We get our story. We get sympathy from everybody we tell our story to. We get someone to blame. We get a target for our anger. We don't have to do the hard work of learning to trust again. Can I trust you? Should I trust you? I forget it. I'm not trusting anybody. So we plant deeper roots. Again, we're not supposed to be here, but we don't know that. Now, because we're here longer than we should, The mind starts doing things like, 
maybe you're not all that great. Maybe you deserved it. Maybe this, maybe that. So you plant deeper roots. Now, because these are the thoughts you're thinking, this is the energy you have. Like energy attracts like energy. So now you're attracting people, circumstances, relationships towards you to confirm, yep, this is exactly where you belong. The misery loves company crowd, they come around now too. It gets worse, but I'll get you out of here. Because it feels so bad, but you don't know there's anywhere else to go, right here is where you start using food, drugs, alcohol, work, TV, keeping busy, reckless behavior, whatever, to numb, avoid, and distract yourself from what's so painful to feel or face. So think about it. You do this for a day, a week, a month now to have it, a year, 10 years, 20 years. I can see someone 20 years out and say, that drinking you're doing, that numbing in front of the TV, that emotional eating you're doing, do you think that has anything to do with your betrayal? And they would look at me like I'm crazy. And it was having 20 years ago. Doesn't matter. All they did was put themselves in stage three and stay there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I thought you said this was going to get better. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm going to get you right out of stage three. And it's so, it's Wait, so interesting. I think a, I, can I have a timeout for a second? So I want to go back because yeah. I just want to make sure I'm clear on the first three I've heard. The first one, I, I sort of surmised it as emotional, but did you call it a different name? The first stage one? Yeah. Stage one is where we're like disproportionately prioritizing the physical and mental needs over the emotional and the spiritual. So we're thinking what would you call that? I'd call that I'd call that the setup stage. Being busy, you know, not not really checking in, turning down your intuition. So just not seeing any of those red flags that are there or making excuses for the red flags. And I totally agree with that because I was the, the lifestyle that I was living with four kids, a business I was running, being in a church that you were never told you were enough. You, Oh, well, you've checked this box off, but there's 10 other boxes. So they, not to talk negatively, but I am, they, they keep you so busy that you yeah. never actually sit and say, am I happy? Am I being fulfilled? Am I all that I could be? Like all of those questions. Exactly. Because, Autopilot. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what Lisa just described, though, doctor, sounds more like the stage four, which was distracting yourself with things. So I guess I'm not. No, that's not. I didn't get to stage four. So I'll, oh. I'll get you. If you want me to get you out of here, I'm happy to. You're, we're, only, we're only in stage three right now. I know, but uh, I, I, just want to be, I just want to be clear on the first ones because the yeah. setup for me was number one. And then the second one was shock. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Is that correct? The third one is you kind of go into survival mode. Yep. Okay. So and now we're on can we talk about the shock too? Because that is that almost like a fight or flight that you're in that situation where, where at first you're running on adrenaline or, and you, you want whatever you want to do, lash out, do whatever you're running on adrenaline, you're going to confront this or you get to the other part where the adrenaline just has you like shaking and not knowing what to do and your body is reacting in certain ways. Is that what you're kind of that yeah, shock and we, unbelief? Absolutely. You know, you ignite the stress response and, and imagine the stress response is beautifully designed for short term, you know, uh, stress. Let, let's say a car's coming at you, blood and oxygen go to the heart, lungs and limbs so you could jump the curb to safety. That's how it's designed, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then things calm down. But what happens when the stress response is ignited, but it's not turned off, it's like you're jumping the curb to safety 24 seven. So at mm -hmm. first you have tons of energy. Then you're like tired, but wired. Then you're just tired. And then yeah. actually that was part of the uh, second discovery, which is that there's this collection of symptoms so common to betrayal. It's known as post-betrayal syndrome. We've had over 50,000 people take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz. Every couple of months, I pull the stats from it. I, they're mind-blowing, and I'm happy to share that. But you want me to get you out of stage four and stage I, five? I, just, I want to talk a little bit about this, too, because um, it's interesting to me when you're talking about the shock and what your body goes into mm -hmm. and whether it's it's that roller coaster that all of a sudden your heart is beating out of your chest again. Exactly. Or And I remember just speaking to a girlfriend that every time um, – this is probably TMI, but every time, you know, I had to address the situation, your body almost did a purge. You're like, yeah. I've, got to, I've got to go to the washroom. And when I was speaking to her too, she's like, every time, you know, I'm in court or whatever, when she's going through a divorce, it's like your body is literally reacting physically to that stress in the situation that you're in. A hundred percent. And speaking of that purge, just one of the stats from the post-betrayal syndrome quiz, 45% of anybody who's been betrayed has a gut issue. And this is anything from Crohn's, IBS, diverticulitis, constipation, diarrhea, you name it. Think about what the gut does, absorbs, digests, and processes food. 
I mean, isn't a betrayal difficult to absorb, digest, and process? Mm -hmm. Any wonder why the gut is Mm -hmm. acting up, you know? So it makes total sense why the body is freaking out the way that it is. And here's what's even crazier. And, and when I share the, the stats from the, from the quiz, if you want to hear them, it's not even necessarily from betrayal that happened recently. I mean, I can share stats from a betrayal. And these are, these are from a betrayal that could have happened decades ago. Very likely, both of you can still have symptoms from your betrayals from decades ago. That's what's so crazy about betrayal. And that's why it needs a very specific protocol to heal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, that's bonkers. And I want to... And I want to get back to your five modalities, but you talked about a second ago, the fight or flight situation. I think a lot of times, at least for me, I always Mm -hmm. thought that, and I understand that process, but I always thought it only pertained to a physical model, like a a saber tooth tiger chasing after me back in pre-primordial days. But it's emotional stuff as well. You go into that fight or flight and how you respond to situations. And I never understood that before. So a hundred percent. You're so right. And you know, also even it's so common to have PTSD symptoms after betrayal too. And we think that's reserved for like the war vets, you know, they, they hear a car backfire. They think they're back in war. It's also for betrayal. You can be, you can have a trigger and you know, these triggers, they can take you right down and your body responds and reacts as if you just received the news again. So, I mean, it's so common and it's so it's there's so much cleanup that's needed, but we think, oh, just time will, you know, time will heal it. Just one of the things from the post-betrayal syndrome quiz, there's a question that says, is there anything else you'd like to share? And people write things like my betrayal happened 40 years ago. I can still feel the hate. My betrayal happened 35 years ago. I'm unwilling to trust again. My betrayal happened 15 years ago. I feel gutted. So we know it's not a time thing. Time doesn't heal it. Mm-hmm. Moving mm-hmm. through the stages heals it. Because as I told you, you know, here I just shared up until stage three, you could stay in stage three for life. And unfortunately, most people do. And it's only stage four and stage five. Do those symptoms go away? And do you actually transform? I totally agree with you. And I'm not, to, I love my mom, but she had like, I'm basically living the same life that she did. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. interesting, but um, she decided younger than I am right now in her forties, then that men, all men are bad. She's not going to open up to another relationship. Is she lonely? Yes. Did she miss a lot of experiences? Yes. Did she get a taste of what a good relationship was? No, but there's, there's no opening for that. And I think that's that's, that's, stage three. She put the wall up. She's like, Nope, I'm going to keep out the bad ones, but I'm going to keep out the good ones too. Yeah. And it's such a shame. It's like, it's, let's say you love cooking and get burned on the stove. It's like, Nope, never cooking again. It's not fair to you. Yeah. You know, so there's, but when you move through the stages and you heal from all of it, then you're approaching relationships from such a different angle, you know, and just here, can you see my hands? I'm going to show you something. You'll never forget this. Here's what happens. We start here and then, you know, there's that breakup, there's that loss, right? And then we're so lonely. We're so upset. We're like, I just want to feel better again. So we go back to this and we spend a lifetime doing this right? And here's the thing. The only thing you attract is more of this. So what we need to do after a betrayal is forget about this person. The only job and intention is for us to do this, heal physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. But you know what happens when the intention is, oh, I just want to be okay with this person. We do this and then we keep sabotaging ourselves because but we like it here, but we keep sabotaging ourselves because we don't want to outgrow them. And then we like it here and we're like, why can't they do this? Because they're not ready. So here's give, what we need. Give us an example of that. When you mean by you keep falling back into that same pattern of sabotage, yeah. give oh, me an example. That, that was my <laughs> whole life. You see what I mean, right? <laughs> Try to transform and fit into where I should be fitting. When you knew in the back of your mind, like this is not for me, and I, I don't want to be a part of it anymore. But what will I be missing? I'll be alone out there. I won't get all these other things that I'm experiencing. But when you label the pros and cons, and you understand what, what am I bringing to this relationship? Am I bringing all the things that I like to it and they're not adding to it? Well, I can do that on my own. Well, yeah, but you, but you did it. So that's what I want to get at. So Lisa, Lisa would be on the lever of, I recognize what he did to me. I know that it's wrong. I know that he doesn't value or respect me. You would confront, right? But then you would fall back into it because she didn't mm-hmm. walk away. So an example of that relapse is her just staying in that space. Is that where you're saying? Okay. So then, I'm sorry. I, I want to get back to the five, but I want to yeah. use myself as an example so that our it's, I want, I want the information you convey 
to be relatable to other people. So when they hear that, they yep. may not understand the psychological fight or flight, the cortisol, all the terminology that you're throwing at mm -hmm, from a, a semantic perspective. But when you drop real examples, it hits home. So for me, I had betrayal from my father. My, my dad was an asshole. He used to beat the shit out of me. He used to beat the shit out of my brothers and sisters. He used to drag my mo mother around by her hair. And I've never understood to this day, my dad died a, a couple of months ago, and I've never understood to this day, I have nine sisters. So I'm going somewhere with this. I have nine sisters. And for whatever reason, they did the same thing Lisa did. They always just accepted what he did to them. Instead of mm -hmm. confronting him and being like, this is wrong, like I did, I beat my dad up. I was so, the last time I saw my father it was a physical confrontation. And I was like, I'm just done with this. What you're doing is not okay. This is not normal. This is not okay. Anyhow, but my sisters never did. And actually I never could understand why they always accepted him. So were they doing the same thing? They just kept falling back into that. I understand though, you're supposed to be kind and turn the other cheek and oh, just kindness. Bullshit. What he did was unacceptable to me and to my sisters, and yet they always fell back into that pattern, sort of like Lisa was just describing. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, and that's what this is. That's that self sabotage. That's when you know someone, something is not in your best interest. But this is so unfamiliar. You're like, well, this is what I know. So you know, this feels good, but I know this. I know how this works. I know how uh, how to hide. How to make this work. You know. Absolutely. This you know, there's so much fear this. involved. This yeah. And so that's what we keep doing. But then we, we, we're like, why can't that this person do this? Well, they're not ready. So what happens is eventually we get here. And when we are so committed to staying here, rock solid, we're not moving. Right. Eventually you get this. Right. This person's like, what happened to you? And you're like, "Ooh, I'm not the least bit interested in what I'm seeing here. So the whole idea is you get here. This is your only job. And either this shows up. Or, you know, you do this, but this can't help. You can't help but meet up here because now this is where you live. You see? And, and, if, you haven't dealt, and if you haven't dealt with that properly, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. If you haven't There's a lot of hand with, puppets going on today. <laughs> I was setting the stage early on in the show. That was just getting your hands The <laughs> Michael that. Jackson thriller, yeah. It made me think of it. Yeah. So, doctor, so when you move up here, and let's just say Lisa has dealt with this situation in terms of her linear linear description of her former husband mm -hmm. but she may not have dealt with that and i may be using the wrong terminology psychosemantically as it pertains to her and her life in general mm -hmm. so so if this with a different disguise on appears as someone else and she hasn't properly dealt with it that's what turns it topsy-turvy that's why she she sort of no I'm, i guess i'm misunderstanding not exactly she wouldn't be here if she's here if she, this is where she's living I'm up there. I'm up there. <laughs> this doesn't show up anymore. You're just, you're not in the same, you're not playing in the same playground. You're just not. So when you're here, and then you just audio. keep doing this. Hang on, because if, if those of us who are just listening on audio, we have to describe. We're doing hand muppets over here, and your descriptors <laughs> are. Lisa has, your descriptor is one hand rising above the chaos and the maelstrom of trouble that's caused her. And the other hand is sort of down here, still umbilically tied to it. And you're just sort of visually trying to show how you address the yeah. I'm, I'm the elevated one, just so everyone knows. And, and, you know, and that's the thing without the healing, like if we're stuck in that stage three, we're just like, oh, this stinks. I'm so lonely. I just want this person back. And all we do is a lifetime of this. When you don't heal, you, you constantly feel like a half and you're looking for another half. That's why I hate that whole you complete me thing. That's the worst thing to do. <laughs> it's you bullshit. want to become right, right. You want to become whole. And the only thing you can attract is another whole person. And then you're a power couple. It's a very different experience. It's interesting to me though. And I, I remember actually, and I've, I've told Devo this too, sitting in, in, in church, looking around and thinking, they're not happy. They're not happy. They're not happy all the couples, but the whole word was enduring to the end. And I think we become stuck and we just think this is normal. I've become so numb to it. I'm just going to keep plodding along, enduring to the end and not realizing that there's a, a whole new world out there. Exactly. And that's why, you know, we found most people find themselves and stay in stage three. That's where they live. And that's where, like you, you explained about your mom, you know, it, it, that's it. It's there's too much risk. There's too much fear. There's too much, unfor, you know, unknown. It's unfamiliar. So we may as well stay with what we know, even if it stinks. And, and that's why we struggle with illness and disease. It's because what, 
yeah, we all these Can I symptoms. Talk about Lisa's mom for a second. I don't mean that metaphorically, really. really. So, Lisa, uh, tell me to shut up if I can't talk about the stuff. But your mom does suffer from gut issues, correct? Am I? Yeah, yeah. Ulcerative, or, uh, or ulcerative colitis, of yeah. course. Yeah, and they've done doctor. So, from at least you can speak to it more than I can, but they've done all sorts of of experimental treatments, and she's tried all sorts of medicines and all sorts of stuff. But it just sort of just sits there. She's in that. She's in that recurring hand collision umbilical cord you were talking about, right? Lise, am I mm-hmm. am correct on that? Mm-hmm. I would love to talk more about this once you finish all the other great things you're telling us um, and understand like holding it within our bodies. I think that is so yeah. interesting to me and how you release that and how you know that that you're still carrying that emotion in your body. Absolutely. Right. And think about it. So, so here, and just, and I'll, I'll get to the, the rest of the stages, but your mom is, you know, could be going to the absolute best of the best of gut doctors. Mm -hmm. But if that gut expert isn't highly skilled in how to move people through betrayal, that's at the root of it. So all she's doing is hacking away at the leaves at best. She's not getting to the root. When you get to the root, everything heals. But it's easier just taking a pill, right? (laughs) Yeah. And that's why we don't heal. That's exactly what's going on. You know, All right, let's get back it. to the five. We've talked okay. about the sort of the okay. setup, shock, the survival, the distraction. What, and the, so we kind of left off in distraction. We took you down a rabbit hole. Sorry. So, okay. So, yeah. So that's the one that we stay in, you know, stage three. And if we're willing to let go of those benefits we're getting, right, grieve, mourn the loss, a bunch of things we need to do, we move to stage four. Stage four is finding and adjusting to a new normal. So here's where you acknowledge, I can't undo my experience, but I can try what I do with it. Just in that decision, you start turning down the stress response. You're not healing just yet, but at least you stop the massive damage you were causing in stages two and stage three. When you make that decision, it's as if you're moving, let's say, to a new house, office, condo, apartment, right? It's like, you don't know your way around. It's not quite cozy yet, but it's going to be okay. And that's what that move to stage three to stage four feels like. But what's so interesting about this one stage is, If you were to move, you don't take everything with you. You don't take the things that don't represent who you want to be in this new space. And what I found was if your friends weren't there for you, right here is where you've outgrown them. You don't take them with you. And I see this all the time. And people say, what the heck? I've had these friends 10, 20, 30 years. Is it me? Yes, it is. You're undergoing a transformation. And if they don't rise, they don't come. Oh, amen. Amen. That was my life. People that I served with for 30 years. Yeah. They, it was almost like I had a plague or I was a leper and they didn't want to catch that, mm-hmm. that uh, having to deal with it, having to do maybe some introspection themselves, yeah. all of that. So yes, both, both friends, you know, you call them in, in, there's a lot of situations in your life where you do need to call your friends, whether you've been betrayed or not, but mm-hmm. in that situation, and I literally also had bonfires where there was things that had a ceremony, burnt stuff and move when I moved to my new home. Mm-hmm. Didn't take, didn't take things. Those things didn't mean anything to me. Started over and loved it. Loved yeah. being able to buy something or create my own new environment. So what you're saying, just it checks off all the boxes. It resonates so well. Doctor, before you continue, sorry, I can't stay on target with this because there's so many questions. I know. So at first, when Lisa said that, you know, her bonfire and, and mm-hmm. moving on and, and her becoming a pariah in her circle, I understand that space. But I'm wondering how much of the environment that she was in, which was a conditional environment to begin with, and all of her friends that out that where she where she was outcast as the pariah, were also part of that system, which Mm -hmm. was a which was a highly conditional um, institution of religion that frowned upon anyone that was an outsider. So my question was, did she lose her friends because she was the pariah? Or did she lose her friends because her friends were afraid of the of the institution that would make them the pariah if they still associated with them? And and you follow where I'm going with this? So it's like there's almost like two factors that were affecting mm-hmm. their relationship with Lisa. They didn't rise up with her because they were losers to begin with, or they didn't rise up with her because they were scared of the of them being cast aside because they did. They follow where I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that. Hundred percent. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of shame around that from both sides, I think. 100%. Mm-hmm. It, it's actually yes to both. And what happens is that's the moment where Lisa could have sabotaged herself, right? We did this to say, this is too hard. I don't want to lose my friends. I, I don't want to outgrow my group. 
It's too scary. It's too unfamiliar. Forget it. Let me just stay. It's a bold move to say, even though um, I, I, I feel so comfortable and familiar with you, that's wrong. It's not where I need to be. I'm going to do this anyway. And then what happens is two things happen with the people around you. Number one, they're forced to take a look at what they're doing. They may not want to, they may not be comfortable with that. Right. And you're sort of outgrowing your group. So that's the moment where self-sabotage often happens right there. But she, you see how strong she was. She was like, no, 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 this is wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm moving to this new house, you know, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And that's where life changes. Okay, I have another question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, Lise, mm -hmm. I'm just going to be candid. Big surprise. Lise and I, and, and we had not been in, and we were both in relationship um, when we first met each other. And, and just so you know, we're business partners, but we're also bedroom partners. Um, we're, we're engaged in all those sorts of things now. So, I just wanted you to know that. Um, but when I first met Lisa, and, I, and we were friends for just, we work and whatnot. And then I, I actually had a, 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 a work event in Canada that I had to do. And Lisa came with me by my invitation and joined me in Canada. And at the end of that trip, Lisa tried to distance herself from me. And I often wondered now that you're saying this and her, and Lisa, you can disagree. And you, you, she, have, this is not a point of dissension. We, we've, we talk about this all the time, but what you just said that relapse, if you will, that umbilical cord, eerily sounds like subconsciously, Lisa might have been trying to distance, and I'm not saying you did or didn't, Lisa, you can respond on your own. How do you tell the difference between that? Because Lisa's response to me was, and I hope I don't get in trouble with saying this, Lisa, but she was sort of like, I'm still, in, I'm still not fully broken from my bond of this former husband, and this might be too complicated, and this, this, you know, we should probably consider not seeing each other until I deal with this first, right? So where I'm going, this is a question, an interrogative question. Was Lisa subconsciously, don't get mad at me, Lisa, I love you to death. Was Lisa subconsciously trying to distance me from her so that she subconsciously was going to fall back into her comfort zone and she just was scared? Or was there something else at play there? Honestly, I think that was the best thing Lisa could have done. She was trying to heal. And she didn't want to take that chance of sabotaging her work and all the effort she was doing by getting sidetracked and derailed. So Fair that's enough. beautiful. Yeah. And, 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 and I always recommend, I mean, the last thing you want to do coming off of a relationship is get into a new one. That's where you have to form that relationship with yourself. That's your opportunity. The last thing you need to do is get into another relationship because if that stuff doesn't get healed, you're only going to have another relationship that's similar. Mm -hmm. And I think she was sort of counting on you not to be that. And so she needed to get herself to a place. So she made sure she attracted who she was becoming and what she deserved. I love that because it, it was quite a while still after um, the final thing with, with my ex, you know, six months into it. And we, we took that trip and, and, you know, um, divorce hadn't happened yet, but you knew it was on the way, but there's a lot going on. There's mm -hmm. a lot going on in your life. And when you can all of a sudden prioritize you as the number one, and this is what I need right now. I need to take care of myself mentally, spiritually, financially, and my kids, and mm -hmm. I can't, there's a lot of shit going on that is my priority to get past this because mm -hmm. it's hard when you're in the middle, but to get to the other side, you just need to like, you, you need everything you can to, to get through that. Yeah. You, you know, it's also an opportunity to become very proactive versus reactive. You know, early on, we're sort of reactive. We're at the mercy of mm -hmm. what's going on. If this person wakes up on the right side of the bed, it's going to be a good day. If this works out, it'll be good. If this happens, it's okay. We're like a ping pong ball in the ocean. But after a betrayal, we had this opportunity to become very proactive and say, okay, what is it that I want? Who do I want to become? And betrayal lends itself to creating an entirely new identity. You leave behind everything that no longer serves and you take the parts you love. So if the, the old version of you was just going along with things that just absolutely didn't make sense, this new version of you is like, no, not doing that anymore. You know, so many things like that. And it's that complete and utter death and destruction of the old. But that's what allows for the birth of the new. And where people just get into trouble is they don't either have that complete and total death and destruction of the old, 
right? So they just try, it's like they just keep trying to patch things up, patch things up. And and the new never has is allowed to show up, whether that's a new you or a new uh, relationship with that person you were with. It, it doesn't that's have that opportunity. So you don't let it all crash and burn. You're, you're making the visualization of patching it up, like basically turning myself into a Frankenstein with all these patches on me, right? <laughs> No, but, but yeah, you know it's what a it catalyst. Is. It's a catalyst yeah, it for something better. Absolutely, absolutely is. And and I, I use this analogy, and I know we still didn't get to uh the fifth stage, but it's it's an and I talk about this in my second TEDx, uh, do you have post betrayal syndrome? And it's this analogy of a house. And here's the difference between resilience and transformation. Resilience is patching up, right? And we need that for our everyday restoring. Trans trauma and transformation, like what you did, whole different thing. Imagine a house and let's say the house needs a new boiler and you get a boiler. That would be resilience. Let's say it needs a new roof. You get a roof. That would be resilience. You're restoring it. Here's trauma and transformation. A tornado comes by and levels the house. A new boiler's not fixing it and a new roof's not fixing it, right? Now, here's the thing, though. You have every right to stand there at the lot where your house once stood and say, this is the absolute worst thing that's ever happened. And you'd be right. And you can call over all your friends and say, isn't this the worst devastation you've ever seen? And they'd all agree. And you have every right to kick and scream and mourn and cry and rage and mourn the loss of your house until your last breath. However, should you choose to rebuild the house? You don't have to. But if you choose to, why would you build the same one? There's nothing there, right? Why not give it everything the old house didn't have? Why not make it better and more beautiful? That's the opportunity. And that's what people don't see. They think the only option is patching up the old house. It's not. Mm -hmm. But it's but what, scary. Leveling what if it. there are some remnants of the old house that actually you did enjoy or that were worthwhile or were likable or did add value? How do you mm -hmm. safely transport those into the new infrastructure? You keep everything you love and you leave behind. It's deliberate and intentional. You keep what you love. You get rid of what no longer serves. If you are open hearted and loving and compassionate, you take that with you. That's beautiful quality. But the part of you who uh, didn't have boundaries in place or turned a blind eye, whatever it was, that's the part you leave behind. And, and that's, that's really interesting person. because yeah. that's, that's understanding that you also played a role in it and what you, what you decided not to see or not act on or make yourself smaller is on you as well. So, mm -hmm. and it's not to say you caused the betrayal at mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. but you, you had this opportunity to look and say, what, what, who was I? And now that I'm, it's like you're sitting there with a bunch of Legos, you know, it's like, who do I want to create now? That's the beauty. That's how transformation happens. And that's what happens in stage four and then leaning to stage five. You want me to go through stage five? Yes. Don't I leave do. us hanging. No, yeah. I do. I do. But I have another question. Sorry. So before you get into the stages of grief and healing, those four mm -hmm. stages, does, does, it, does every five, sorry, does everybody go through these stages at their own speed, I'm assuming, correct? Some people, some people don't go through them at all. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, some people don't go through them at all. And here's the thing. I thought when I was doing this study, I was like, well, the people who were the hardest hit would probably grow the least because they had so much more to overcome. That had nothing to do with it. In fact, there were three groups who did not heal. Um, I could share what who they were. The It was really the ones that had a willingness and were just willing to put their head down and just keep going until they were out the other side, right? The three groups who didn't heal, one group, they refused to let go of their story. Deeply rooted in stage three, they weren't having it. That was their story. They were sticking with it. The second group, they were numbing, avoiding, distracting. They ran to the doctor who put them on a mood stabilizer, anti-anxiety medication. They started drinking, you know, emotional eating. May have made the day a bit easier, not without a price. They didn't move. And the third group, this was the group where the betrayer had very little consequences. So this is where they did all they could to just, you know, like get over it and whatever. I saw two things with this group. Number one, only a further deterioration of the relationship. And number two, this group was by far the most physically sick. Your broken heart can't handle that. They didn't heal. So this group that gets stuck and complacent and never heals, obviously therapy treatment from somebody who understands inside and out of how to get to the root of the problem is, is a requirement at this point. But does anybody ever... Is anyone ever able, by doing their own inner engineering work, able to move through these spaces on their own by being 
self-aware about it, first of all, and then being introspective and putting in the time and energy to figure you one can heal themselves, right? Sure. But here's what you, know, you mentioned therapy. We have so many people coming into the PBT Institute with therapy trauma uh, because the wrong type of therapy or the wrong type of support does more harm than good. Like listen to Lisa's example, where if she were just to listen to her friends, right, she'd be made to think, oh, I'm making a big deal out of this. It must be me. All right, forget it. I just have to find a way to just get over this. And then let's say she went from there. Pray to, a little m bit more and pay more tithing and you'll be you, fine. Yeah. And then if you go from there to maybe you speak to, let's say your mom, who's like, this is the best you can expect, honey. Get used to it. You know, whatever, uh, you know, who knows? And so then it, that support is crucial and it's, and, and it is absolutely a game changer. Even if we find some, uh, like a support group, so often it's that like ain't it awful club where it's almost like if you heal, you don't belong. So what do we do, right? We sabotage ourselves so we don't outgrow our new friends. Yeah. That's the name of this that's, that should be the, the title of this podcast, the Ain't It Awful Club. I like that. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, it makes, it, it's such a huge thing. But yeah, can you move through the five stages on your own? You absolutely can. Look, Lisa did. You know, I did before so I did the discoveries. That's because she tithed extra, extra amounts. And so yeah, yeah. That must be it. What you just said a second ago, Lisa, and, and doctor, the same thing was my mother. I, I used to remember thinking my dad would literally beat the shit out of my mother, like beaten and bloody shit. And then, and then a few hours would go by and he would call her up into his room and they'd be in there for whatever doing makeup sex. That's how all 12 of us were born. But aside from that, he was brainwashing her into that sort of dom domestic model violence of beat her down, build her up. And I remember her coming out of that room like a ghost, first of all. And, and I, I remember, sorry, I'm just thinking for a second, getting a little emotional on this. I remember going up to her and like trying to console her around stuff and, and her sort of like mechanically pushing me away and telling me that it was her fault that she had done whatever she had done. And this could have been like not having his slippers ready or not having his dinner made the right way, whatever, like stupid, most ridiculous things ever. And I just remember thinking at four, five, six years old, like why would you get in trouble for something as inane and stupid as that? And why is it your fault? And what in the good God would warrant you to have the living life nearly beaten out of you because you were cooked his ramen noodle or whatever the fuck it was, right? So she was sort of in that stage of, it was sort of between shock and survival at all the times, right? Never really knowing how to get past it, always blaming herself for it. Fuck me. Okay, sorry, carry on. No, and, and, and that's the thing. And here she was, this, this loving woman who just, she drank the Kool-Aid, you know? And she believed the only way to survive and keep all of you, you know, maybe safe, was by taking it on herself. And listen, I'm a mom of four. I get it. You do anything for your kids, right? And and in her mind, that's what she thought was the best she could hope for and the best she could do. And the best thing you can do is look at that situation and say, thanks, mom. I know you did the best you could given what you were dealing with. And now I know. And what I'm not going to do is just sort of remember and regurgitate I'm going to almost make believe I'm a dyslexic where the message is so jumbled up. So this way, when it comes out of me, I broke the chain. That's the gift. Then it's trauma well served. So she's 76 years old today. And, you know, she's separated from my father many years ago. She actually divorced him at our, our, our sort of prodding. And she's been living on her own, doing her own thing for the better half of 25 years now. But she's never really done anything. I hope my mom doesn't get upset in the same way. She's never really done anything with her life. She hasn't remarried like Lisa's mother. She just sort of just lives a life of, of yeah. solitude. She goes to work every day, comes home. She has a few of her children that are in the same town as she. I'm not one of them. Um, but I always wondered, because she's an amazing woman, very talented, very charismatic, very hard, hard worker, but she's never really done anything. Is it because she's just sort of stuck in her own shadow because of all this? 100%. 100%. So at 26 years old, having conversations with people like yourself, there's there's modalities that you could help her in this space. I don't know what help means, It's but she could move beyond whatever her shadow is telling her right now. It's proven. 
it's proven. And here's the thing, age has nothing to do with it. And the beauty is if I tell you how many people when they're in that stage four or stage five, that's when new relationships are born. That's when new businesses get birthed. That's where new levels of health, because it's only after they move through all of that, the dust settles and they're like, oh, if I did that, what else can I do? And that's when it takes off. There's such a there's such a, it's like, here's this negative spiral going on. And then the negative spiral stops and they start this upward spiral and life changes. It's so different. I never would have opened the PBT Institute before my betrayal. No, we have people who've started businesses and relationships. I mean, it's amazing, but we don't, we don't even see the opportunities waiting for us because we're carrying this like 500 pound ball of burden, you know, burden. When we put that down, we're like, oh, What's what's beyond that door? We don't we don't even think there's an opportunity. We don't even know it's there until we clean up some of that other stuff. That's I, the feeling. I like how you say on your site, crisis is a gift, and to reframe that and understand that there's so much potential that's that's missed. Well, well, that's the thing. It's like you owe it to yourself to do something really good with something really painful. Otherwise, it's like a bad game of hot potato. You know, it lands on you and that's where it stays. Like, what is that? I mean, I, I, I could have been the poster child for betrayal and that would have been my story, but it's such a better story mm -hmm. to help countless people because of what I'm doing with it. You know, it's like we decide what we do. We, we have love to, a happy ending. <laughs> well, you know, but it's it's just that's the opportunity. It, that's the opportunity. And is if you bother to go through something so earth shattering, so painful, so physically, mentally and emotionally debilitating. That's what's waiting for you. It's stage five. It's a new version of you. And that was actually the first discovery that healing from betrayal is so different. It's different than post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is like the upside of trauma. How any trauma leaves you with a new awareness, insight, perspective you didn't have. But I was like, no, I've been through death of a loved one. I've even been through disease. This is different. I asked all my study participants, I said, if you've been through other traumas, is it different for you? Hands down, unanimously, they said it's so different. And it's because of the shattering of the self, rejection, abandonment, confidence, belonging, worthiness, trust. When you rebuild all of that, it's, it's a different state of being. So I coined a new term, post-betrayal transformation. That's the rebuild of your life and yourself after an experience. So Devo, to answer your question, your mom, if she were to simply move through the stages at 76, 78, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference. Life begins. I, 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 um, I I'm fascinated that. by this. I, I'd be interested in having a conversation with you um, and connecting the two of you and potentially paying for whatever services because I, I always sort of felt guilty as her son that, that I never, maybe this is my own, be, betrayal, um, PTSD, if that's the right way to say it. I always sort of felt guilty that she never had the opportunity to go on and do real potential that she possessed because she had been hammered down for so long. And she's doing everything amazing that she can with the tools she has. But I always felt like, God, she she could, as a partner, if, if I hate to say I want to see my mom with another person, but like she, if anyone deserves, and Lisa's mom as well, sounds like if anybody deserves to have a better life, it's the people that have been battered for so many years, like my mother, and they're just sort of riding out the waves until they die, so to speak. And oh man, she's, I, I agree. she's doing the best she can in stage three. That's the thing. All she can do in stage three, and she's doing that. But life doesn't even begin until stage four and five. I feel like there's a lot of people too, and, and we can all be a part of this, the would have, could have, should have. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, my mom was, is, was, she's vastly talented, vastly talented. Mm -hmm. But they take that seat where they say, you know, I, I really wanted to do this. I, I could have done this. I, I'd be really good at doing this. But whether it's a decision that they feel like they're too old or it's too late or they've missed their opportunity mm -hmm or don't want to give themselves that gift and step it, into it. It's so crazy. And you know, and I remember even when I was graduating, a guy emails me and he's like, oh, we're graduating together. I'm like, oh, that's great. I'll see you there. He goes, you know, remind me of, of your name. I'm not quite good with names. I'm 79. 79 and getting a PhD. Life begins. Life begins when you make that decision to just keep going. Mm -hmm. 
The age has, your age has nothing to do with it. The stage has everything to do with it. Everything. You, you know, it's kind of funny. It, it, you're talking about a, a psychological treatment and a therapy and a modality of betrayal that sort of leads down all sorts of pain and discourse based upon people's lives. But it's almost impossible for anybody to have ever lived a life that didn't have some sort of trauma. And how many of the, like whether it's betrayal or, or, or abuse or mm -hmm. rejection or uh, abandonment or trust issues. Like I, I challenge anyone to say they've lived a perfect life and haven't had some sort of pain, mm -hmm. but those that have gone on to happiness and success, quote unquote, is it fair to say that they've dealt with those and they've moved through all the different channels of this psychology, right? And those that haven't, they're just sort of stuck in these patterns of whatever it is that they're dealing with, right? It's not even psychology as much as mindset. Like for example, and, and I'll even add to what you shared, it doesn't even have to be trauma. It could be, and I talk about this in From Harden to Heal, what gets people in stage three, it could be the meaning you made from something. Like, let's say you had some earth shattering news to share with your mom and you're like seven, you know, you race into the kitchen, she's on the phone and she's like, shh. Now, right at that very moment, you could have made that to mean you don't matter. Now you feed that. Now you throw some emotion behind it. Now it picks, you know, picks up steam. Your mind always wants to prove you're right. So now before long, you're living a life of I don't matter with evidence to support it. Your whole life now is a representation of I don't matter from something you made to mean back when you were seven, where it was just misunderstood. So it doesn't even have to be trauma. I love that because you're, I think there's so many stories that we tell ourselves that mm -hmm. That wasn't actually the story. We've we've depicted it in a different way. Something that was said offhanded, and we yeah. take it personally to mean something totally different. And it reframes so many things in our life, and so many decisions, whether it's our confidence or 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 our direction. And think about it. That. Let's say you know you form this "I don't matter" belief when you're seven, right? And then we have between you know sixty and eighty thousand thoughts a day. So let's say you have you know as a as a subconscious running program, "I don't matter" showing up thirty, forty thousand times a day. Can you see why you choose the relationships you choose? Why you opt in or opt out of certain things because you feel you're not worthy enough, not good enough, not this enough, not that enough, just because of that one shush, right? Mm -hmm. that's how it that's how it can happen so i get shushed by lisa on a regular basis but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm actually going so i'm being a smart ass but that's just me a lot so it sort of sounds nebulous to me in a bit because and this is my interpretation by the way mm -hmm. so i'm asking you to clarify that so mm -hmm. i always have a choice in how i respond to any sort of trauma if you will right mm -hmm. if lisa shushes me i could start going on the ground and kicking and crying crying like a baby and mm -hmm. pouting or I could just acknowledge it for what it is. She's actually busy doing something of value and I just need to have patience, which I don't, and just sort of go about my business. How I deal with that response is based upon my emotional development, kind of going back to all the things that we've talked about, whether I have trauma around my dad beating me or my girlfriend and my best friend cheating on me or whatever. And I've got all sorts of crazy stories that actually really wasn't that bad. She was, anyway. But how I respond to Lisa is based upon where I am in my stages of my own personal development, correct? Yeah, she's she could be triggering something that is just unhealed in you. Because if if that's not an issue, you know, her shushing you is like, all right, I'll come back in five minutes. You know what I mean? It's no big deal. But if it's if it's unhealed, anything on the outside triggers what's going on on the inside. Well, shit, maybe I need to do therapy then because I was be like, no, just talk to me right now, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, so we need to talk. I need more therapy. <laughs> Do you have yeah. a family rate? No. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Me and my moms are going to see you simultaneously. 12 siblings. 12. Oh, my Bring God. Bring them on. Yeah. We got it. Dude, we got dude, all. They you know all what? need some form of therapy, yeah. dog. That's, that's it. It's like there's nothing. Uh, it's all based on the research. It's all based on what the study proved we need. And and now that there are five stages, like I could tell where you're at based on your story. And all it takes is, okay, what does it take just to move to the next stage and the next and the next and the next? But so, without so a willingness, you know, no I one's going to finish. Yeah. I need you to finish stage five. But I do want to ask you that question just so I can get some free therapy. At the end of the show, knowing the knowing the basic high level stories that you've heard from Lisa and the basic mm -hmm. high level stories that you've heard from me and the countless other people just like us, right? 
hearing those stories, if, if you had to make a gut assessment right off the bat of something that we could or should do right now to get back into the path of self-awareness and healing, and you don't have to answer this now, what would you say to that? And I want to get to that question. So go, I'm sorry. So, Lisa, so basically a toolkit to walk away with. Yeah. yeah. Things to... The toolkit number one is know, know what stage you're in and know what. Right, well, hold, you, hold your thoughts on that. Cause I want to get back. Yeah. We never actually finished your five approaches. Sorry. I'm sure. Thank, okay. Welcome to, the, welcome to our podcast. We have a form and function, but we rarely stick with it. All right, go. No worries. <laughs> All right. So, so, st- so let's say you're in this new mental space. You're making it cozy. You're making it home. You're in stage four, right? Once you're in there for a while, you're good with it. You're making it th- this your new way of being. You move into the fifth most beautiful stage, and this is healing, rebirth, and a new worldview. The body starts to heal. Self love, self care eating well, exercising. You didn't have the bandwidth for that earlier. You were surviving. Now you do. Your mind is healing. You're making new rules. You're making new boundaries based on what you see so clearly now. And you have a new worldview based on your entire experience. And the four legs of the table in the very beginning, it was just all about the physical and the mental. By this point, we're solidly grounded because we're focused on the emotional and the spiritual too. Those are the five stages. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, so, Lise, you where, were asking where were you before I got married? <laughs> where was I before my own betrayal? I hear you. <laughs> is, is that what happened to you? Because you, you, I, I didn't read all about the details. You had betrayal of your own, similar to Lisa's. Yeah, it was. Well, it was my family, and then uh-huh. I thought I did everything I needed to do to heal, and then a few years later, it was my husband. So, got him out of the house, and I was like, "What's similar to these two experiences? Me, but what else?" Boundaries were always getting crossed, never took my own needs seriously. And I was like, I'm done with that. So for me to enroll in that PhD program, I never did anything like that. That was the first thing I ever did for me. And it changed my life. But then just to close the loop on that, rebuilding is always a choice, whether we rebuild, rebuild ourselves and move on. That's what I did with my family. It wasn't an option to rebuild with them. Or if the situation lends itself, if you're willing, if you want to, you rebuild something entirely new with the person who hurt you. And um, as two completely transformed people, not long ago, my husband and I actually married each other again. New rings, new vows, new dress, and our four kids is our bridal party. And and I can promise you never in a bazillion years would I have ever done anything like that if I wasn't totally different and for sure if he wasn't. Betrayal will show you who someone truly is. It'll also wake them up to who they temporarily became. And then you have a choice what you want to do with that. So the question that is to be asked you you went you you and your husband had a reunion this is the same husband that you left correct yeah yeah so yeah we were I'm done not, that I'm was the deal breaker i'm not, i'm not being coy here so the, the the question begs to ask that you went back or he, he went back or you rejoined however what's here, the difference up here yeah. what's exactly. the difference because you were both at the set that that healing right you didn't fall back to your old patterns and you healed both of you and you came together with the new house. That, that, that was the deal breaker. So I was like, all right, now here I am. I'm on my own. Four kids, six dogs, a thriving business, and now a PhD. I have to figure this out. I had no intention of getting back with him. That was the deal breaker. And on his own, he it was the biggest shock of his life just to wake up to who he had become. And I think for him, he actually was the one who told our kids. And I think sitting your four kids down and they're looking at you, you know, four teenagers, like you did what to mom? If anything is going to have you wake up and realize what matters, it's it's losing everything that matters. So I think that's where he just did the work on his own. And we met up again as two entirely different people. And he's the biggest supporter of my work. Now think about it. It takes a certain kind of person to, to, to be okay with that. When he's the one who here, I'm opening an institute because I am. You know, this, people say that, oh, nobody changes. People can't change. And here you're proving it can be done in the right way. Takes a tremendous amount of work. This was harder than me being in ICU for 11 days. Yep. Hardest thing I've ever done. Lisa, uh, in, in terms of people not being able to change, I completely agree with you. And I hear that all the time. And one of the stuff that I've been studying over the last few years is the concept of epigenetics. And you were familiar with this now because Dr. Joe Dispenza, your best friend, has sort of gotten into that space. So a lot of what you do sort of comes down into that space. Like you're altering your paradigm by changing your DNA of thought, your DNA of pattern, your DNA of repetitious work that never changed, worked for you before. 
And in, 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 at the crux of it, that's exactly what you're doing. And you're changing people's cellular logic or thought modality of how they see themselves. Exactly. And that's the only way that's, the, that's that house that has been completely demolished. And that's the, that's the new house that gets built because of that work. This is the brilliant stuff. Okay. So toolkit, you have five minutes to pass on everything you know to me to make myself fantastic, to change Lisa's life forever so that we can both meet at the same level, which I sort of feel like we already are, but sometimes mm -hmm. she's a little bit beyond me. Um, what do I need to do in my toolkit to level up with Lisa? You know, see, see where you're not showing up powerfully and fully see where, what needs healing, see what needs cleaning up. Don't, don't just hope it's going to go away. Just, it isn't like, well, I'm good. As long as I don't see them, that's not good. That's not good. Heal for good. Right. It's, it's, it's not like I'm, I'm only good if I'm not thinking about it or talking about it. That's not good. Clean this stuff up once and for all. So it's no longer a part of your life. And you know, it's cleaned up when the memory's there, but not the emotional charge when the emotional, and I'm not saying where you're, you're not feeling the sympathy, let's say for your mom, I'm not talking about that, but when the, the anger and the rage is still there, that needs cleaning up. And what I see so often is we go, actually, it's this trajectory where we go from extreme sadness, like, oh my gosh, how could they do this? You know, and then we get angry. How can you do this? And then it's like pity. You're like, really? That's what you have to do? And then we go to compassion. And then you're good. But what the, the biggest thing I see is when someone goes from, let's say, sadness and anger to even pity, it's almost like they're so in it and it's all about them. But there's something that shifts when you get to that point of pity where it's like you're looking at it much differently where it's like oh wow I get it it's not me it's you huh right very healing from there forward so find out where you are so before you diagnose Lisa and I, I want you to do the same thing um there's a quiz on your on your site um is that something that I should take and others to sort of start with that introspection I, I absolutely we have two quizzes there. One is the uh, the post betrayal syndrome quiz to see to what extent you're still struggling. The other is the healed or hardened quiz. And uh, and you'll see what stage you're in. I mean, that takes less than two minutes. You'll know exactly what stage you're in and why. And, and just knowing from what you've seen right now, are there ticks or tendencies or uh, verbal cues in talking with me that you right off the bat would be able to observe given your expertise? Like, all right, he's fucked up. I know he needs here, here, and here. <laughs> I think I most say, of humanity is fucked up. There's, yeah, there's things the about most, us that we have our quirks. It's okay. In the most <laughs> loving way I could share with you, there's work to be done. Thank you. I know there's lots of work to be done. All right, Lisa, it's time for you to diagnose Lisa. Go. Oh, Lisa what? has done a tremendous amount of work to heal. She is clearly in stage four or five. That's where she lives. And she's yeah, a participant and she may, ribbon. Yes. She may, you know, kind of have moments where she's slipping, but she's living in that stage four, stage five. You can just tell by who she is, how she's showing up. And even like, even Lisa, in your languaging, you're sort of referring to like the stage three version of you, but that's not who you really are. And you know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I see. It's been an evolution. Mm hmm. And it's been exciting and not to talk about me, but hey, let's talk about me. It's opened up doors in my life, people that were there, but I never saw that allowed me to do things I never would have given myself permission to do before. Yeah. You can't do that in stage three, stage four and five. It opens up to you. Mm -hmm. That's why that's where you live. These, these opportunities are showing up now because you're building this house, this beautiful house that never would have had the opportunity to be built had that not show up. And those people in your life and all of that, they're mourning the loss of the old house. You've already started building a new one. It's a whole different way to live. And it, it changes actually your self-esteem as far as seeing other people doing things and feeling a little envious or like, ugh. instead you're like, that's badass. She's amazing. She's killing it doing that. And, and it, it changes your elevation and your mood and how you think about yourself. Yeah. yeah. A whole lot of self-love there. Yeah. Good job. So doctor, this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate you taking us down the rabbit hole and, and indulging us with our copious amounts of questions. So uh, we can find you and I'm gonna let you do it yourself, but I have up on the screen, the PBT Institute, that's P as in Paul, B as in boy, T as in Tom, institute.com. As in post-betrayal transformation institute. Yep. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and that's why she's there. a doctor. <laughs>
And that's why I'm going to seek her guidance. Uh, so today we talk a lot of, about a, a lot of different things, but at the core of it is the psychology of transformation and human potential. We talked about shock or the five uh, five modalities of, of betrayal. And I think I have them right up on the screen if I'm not correct me, but shock, devastation, anger, grief, and eventual healing. I'm still in the first two stages of evolution, which I have a lot of work to do, it sounds like. Um, but I've really enjoyed our time with you. You've answered some some really critical questions, but more importantly, you've just dropped a lot of cathartic thought seed for us to sort of kind of dive into. Um, I think my biggest takeaway, at least before I let you jump in on yours, was that no matter where we are in our stages, there's still hope for us if we can just be self-acknowledgement around that there might we might actually need some help and not continue down our own perpetual state of of self-devastation, correct? As long as you're breathing, there's hope. Fantastic. Lee? Oh, that's what I was going to say. There's no expiration date on us. It's never too late. Great. And I thought, I thought you know, I, was, I started in my 50s, which seemed old, but it's not. It's not. I, f I feel like I've got a few good years left still. So, oh, hey. Sure. <laughs> I went back for the PhD at 50. That life begins. Life yeah. begins when you when yeah. you really wake up and realize, wow, there's I'm I'm here to do something important. And it's like yeah. you you just you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the world. You can't go through something and not share it. That's just right. I just look at that as selfish. Yeah. If you had to leave the planet today and you had to impart your gift of infinite wisdom to us before you left, um, this, your mothership has arrived and it's time for you to move on to the next stage of your life. Mm -hmm. What is the gift you're gonna leave us? Uh, the the gift is the PBT Institute. I mean, uh, it's like how AA is to alcohol, the PBT Institute is to betrayal, and that's the intention. Uh, and it's just the devastation is so painful, but you don't need to stay in that pain for long. Just move through the stages. And I just, I, I would love everyone to know, uh, if you have to say this a million times to yourself, it's worth it. Even though it happened to you, it's not about you. It's really not. It's not about you. That's brilliant. Thank you, doctor. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.